Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Ethics and Politics of Energy Systems, the fourth in a series of energy system webinars from the Energy System Signature Area at the University uh, of Alberta. The Energy System webinar series has multiple sessions. Each seminar builds on topics of the previous sessions to give participants a more complete picture of energy systems and our current transition to a low hydrocarbon future. We'll emphasize a multidisciplinary approach focusing on technologies and process, environmental and societal impacts and their mitigation, ethical considerations, and how energy systems integrate into our daily lives. This series is designed to help guide your awareness of the complex web of technologies, politics, economics, environmental and, so and social considerations affecting the energy transition. My name is Juliana Lung, and I'm happy to be the moderator for this webinar today. I'm a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, where I work in subsurface reservoir modeling. My team and I simulate different subsurface processes related to hydrocarbons production, carbon dioxide storage, and geothermal reservoirs. My pronouns are she, her, and I should have added that to, my, uh, to the screen too, but uh, I'm going to add it to my Zoom name. And if you haven't already done so, I would invite you to add your pronouns to your Zoom name too. Um, we, can, we begin our webinar by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Alberta is located on uh, Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda Sioux, Iroquois, Diné, Ojibwe, Sotos, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories and language and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. As we explore energy systems, we acknowledge the territories, communities, and peoples that have been essential partners in this research. And we are truly grateful to have the opportunity to work, study, and live on this land. Today in the fourth session, we will be learning about how political, economic, social, and legal considerations are affecting our climate change and energy policy. Learning about how these issues influence the policymaking process could help us better understand why different municipalities, regions, or even countries are at different stages of the energy transition. To help answer the questions today, we have four esteemed speakers from the University of Calgary, University of Alberta, and the City of Edmonton to walk us through a number of examples involving both local and national contexts. And they are Dr. Melanie Thomas, University of Calgary, Associate Professor from the Department of Political Science. Dr. Laura Wheeler, University of Alberta, Assistant Professor from the Department of Economics. Martin Oshinsky, University of Calgary, Associate Professor from the Faculty of Law, and Stephanie McCabe, Deputy City Manager, Urban Planning and Economy from the City of Edmonton. Welcome. Each speaker will give a 15 minutes presentation and at the end of these presentations, we'll open the panel to audience questions. You can submit your questions through the Q&A box on Zoom throughout the session. Please indicate the name of the speakers you would like to direct your questions to. And the Zoom chat is also available for you to discuss among yourselves, share thoughts, or if you are experiencing any technical challenges. Please be sure to stick around to the end to take our survey. Um, the survey is aimed at understanding what you might like to see offered in the future after this webinar series. The information we're collecting will help us develop an energy system curriculum. You find the link to the survey in the chat, and we are excited to present today's session and encourage you to sign up for future webinars. Past, present, and future webinars will be posted on the Future Energy System YouTube and Energy System Signature Area website as soon as they become available. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Melanie Thomas, pronouns as she, they. She is a political scientist at the University of Calgary. Her research helps identify how Canadians think uh, about themselves in politics and explain how this is structured by gender, sexism, and racism, and then develops potential solutions that uh, ameliorate and strengthen our democratic politics. So welcome, Dr. Thomas. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction and for, uh, yeah, inviting me to, to uh, participate with this today. Uh, I am coming to you from my home in Calgary, which is in Treaty 7 territory. Uh, and so I'm glad that we can all be gathered here today to do this work. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, okay, so this is part of a larger project um, where... Uh, 
yes. Uh, this particular project, it's uh, we're looking at uh, a whole host of things related to energy transition. And specifically, when we mean energy transition, we mean transitioning away from fossil fuels like oil, gas, and coal towards more renewable sources of energy. And so research has come through and has said, this is just a quote from uh, a letter that was published in Nature in 2016 by political scientists that were looking at some of the politics of energy transition. Um, they say in many, if not most countries, rapid progress towards a low carbon economy seems technically feasible, but politically impossible. And so part of our work is to actually explicitly dig into the public opinion about energy transition in particular. And so in our work, we explicitly ask uh, not just about attitudes about climate change, not just attitudes about environmental policy, uh, but explicitly about moving away from fossil fuels towards more renewable sources of energy. Uh, in a context like Alberta, the politics of this are going to be particularly fraught, and we can see lots of it on display now in current events, but I think it's it's a through line into how I see um, a lot of things dealing with provincial politics in Alberta, but also how that translates into national politics in Canada. Uh, two existential threats are cued. Uh, one is the existential threat from climate change, um, which I'm sure folks in the audience are familiar with, so I won't get into the, the research on that. But I want to focus instead on the political threat. And this is coming specifically from the current government of Alberta, but we've seen it in earlier iterations. Uh, Premier Kenny has gone and said that Alberta is under siege when we think about context of transition, or that climate policies are deliberately targeted against Alberta. And we can see it even in, in the news um, over the past day or so with the use of the carbon tax and how we're dealing with the politics of gas, uh, gas taxes and, um, and gas pricing uh, in a context where it's not the environment that's driving the prices for these kinds of things, right? And so Alberta and this regional alienation and how that gets used at, uh, as like a, it, as a foil, um, one of the things I think people can reasonably expect, or I would be I would expect reasonable people to look at this and say, this suggests that energy transition is not going to get a whole lot of public support in Alberta, that the politics of it make it somewhat toxic here. Uh, it's fair to say elite political messaging could be interpreted as something like energy transition is an existential threat to Alberta because it is an existential threat to specifically the oil and gas industry. We explicitly ask how many Albertans actually see it this way. And so what I'm presenting will be data that were collected immediately following the 2019 provincial election, but we have uh, other data collections that we've done either through uh, our research team that I'll describe in a moment, where we're looking at British Columbia, Alberta, Ontario, and Quebec, uh, in addition to Alberta, uh, but also through uh, work that we've done in other contexts as well. And so we've replicated or repeated these findings quite often. And so I'm quite, I'm confident in their, in their results that we have. Um, the team that I'm working with is with Laurie Thorlickson at the University of Alberta and also with a postdoctoral fellow, Brooks Tassilia, here at the University of Calgary. And the largest goal of the project is to understand politics as a key constraint on specifically action towards climate change, uh, but specifically looking at the political effects on energy transition. Uh, and so this is the idea that we think that politically people, some people are still gonna come out and say that they think that climate change isn't a thing, but instead we think what most of this is gonna, most of the resistance is gonna be coming through. Uh, we need to deal with climate change, sure, uh, but we also seeing like transition away from fossil fuels. So energy transition as, um, as this kind of political existential threat. So the key questions we ask are, what do Albertans actually think about energy transition? We ask how it's shaped by who they are. So to see if there's any kind of systematic sociodemographic variation, if women are more likely to support transition than men, um, if people working in oil and gas are more likely to support transition, things along those lines. Um, how is it shaped who, by what Albertans believe, um, by their preferences, their political preferences, their policy preferences, their economic preferences. And then we also look at this by how this is shaped by settler colonialism. I'll touch on this briefly, um, but the, the main thrust of this is that many of the uh, claims that are made by indigenous nations for autonomy over their land often relate to 
uh, oil and gas projects or fossil fuel extraction or extractions along those lines. And so one of the things that we're interested in with respect to energy transition is how um, settlers in a settler colonial context react to those indigenous claims and if this makes them more or less or what, what effect this has on their attitudes towards transition. Most of our data for this part of the project come from unique survey experiments, and that's what I'll present here. But we also have data that's looking at media, uh, media narratives, uh, corporate narratives in their public facing documents, um, which may or be more or less sincere <laughs> than some of the other things that we've seen. Um, but uh, all this to say, the, the work that we're using here are data from unique survey experiments, in addition to some other stuff I can talk about if folks have questions about it. Okay, so fair warning, this next slide has a lot of information going on it, but I'm going to draw your attention to what I think are the most important parts. We asked a series of questions about energy transition. So if you look at the transition question, it's the column on the top left. Um, we asked separately, Alberta should move away from oil and gas. We asked this separately from Alberta should move towards renewable sources of energy. One of the things about energy transition is that it's seen very much as a both and, not in either or. So people don't necessarily see this as a zero sum trade off. Um, what they what we see is that people are thinking about moving away from oil and gas um, uh, separately from moving towards more renewable sources of energy. And so I just want to pull out that I think they're part of the same concept, but they're not seen as zero sum. And so asking people what they think about in terms of moving away from fossil fuels and moving towards renewable sources of energy, they're not they're not seen as a zero sum trade off. I want you to focus on these numbers here. We would say 59% in terms of public opinion is a strong majority in favor. So a strong majority of Albertans believe uh, that or agree that Albertan should move away from oil and gas. Um, an absolutely outstanding supermajority thinks that Alberta should move towards more renewable sources of energy. Um, we're even on things like 50-50 on expanding oil and gas. Um, lots of folks are proud of Alberta's oil and gas industry, but this doesn't change the fact that folks want to move towards more renewable sources of energy. Um, I can ask, like, get into more questions about this um, if folks have questions, but one of the things that comes through really clearly, we'll see in the next couple of slides. So here I've just got a picture to help highlight some of the results that we've, we've seen in a lot of our data. This is simply looking at sociodemographic predictors, so who somebody is and how that um, affects their support for energy transition. So that horizontal line here, this means no effect. If any of the dots or the tails touch this line, it means no effect. Uh, in order for something to have a clear effect, it would need to be very clearly away from the line, if it's to the left, it's a negative effect. If it's to the right, it's a positive effect. Um, one of the things that's really clear about this is who somebody is doesn't have a whole lot of effect on like how they think about energy transition. So I know that there's lots of narratives about say people who would work in industry and it's true, people who work in oil and gas are significantly though slightly more likely to oppose energy transition than people who don't. But our measure of this captures people who work in industries that aren't necessarily like directly related to oil and gas, but they're people where their clients are mostly related to oil and gas, right? Uh, and so there's that effect is there for sure. Um, similarly with people who like their personal finances might not have been as great in 2019 as what they were in 2018, there we can see uh, a slight negative effect. But for the most part, People aren't reacting to like effects of climate change, including more extreme weather events like a natural disaster. That's not doing something. Race isn't doing a lot. Religion isn't doing a lot. Being a parent isn't doing anything. Um, being in a rural area isn't doing anything. I know lots of folks want to say that regionalism is driving a lot of this stuff, but uh, not really in this context, suburban, like we're not really seeing a lot about sociodemographics where we see much stronger effects about how people feel about energy transition relates to their values and their beliefs and their preferences in politics. But even again here, it's not necessarily the things that people would expect, uh, or they're not like the biggest predictors are not necessarily what, what things protect. So the first thing I would point out is that there isn't a whole lot of stuff that drives support for energy transition higher. And this isn't to say that it's because like people don't want energy transition. I would say quite the reverse. What I think we're seeing are 
what we're seeing are ceiling effects that support for things like energy transition is already really high. Uh, and so we're going to see more things that are likely to bring it down rather than to bring it up. And this is why I think the most important point to take away is that Albertans are supportive of energy transition on like in significant majorities, right? I don't know what's going on with social conservatism here. The one thing I want to point out is what makes people want transition more is if they're worried about climate change, not whether or not they believe it's human caused, but if they're actually worried about it. I also want to draw out things that are the negative predictors, but not necessarily like the biggest ones that people would expect. It's not really driven by UCP partisanship. No, being a new Democrat isn't doing a whole lot of things either. Identifying uh, emotionally with the left or right does what we would expect it to do. This is the further right somebody is, the more likely they are to oppose transition, certainly. Populism, though, isn't doing a whole lot. Uh, neither is being super proud in Alberta or being a strong, uh, like alienated Westerner. This isn't really driving a whole bunch of this stuff. Racism matters, certainly, and that matters for um, particularly Indigenous claims and how people react to Indigenous claims. But the consistent biggest predictors are this economic conservatism and future hope in oil and gas. The future hope in oil and gas is, is a pretty elegant measure that we use. These are people who um, think that oil and gas is going to be uh, the most important industry in Alberta, and that this is going to continue to be Alberta's most important um, industry in 25 years. The more people agree with that, that oil and gas is going to be key to Alberta's future, though obviously the more likely that they oppose energy transition moving away from oil and gas. Um, here, for economic conservatism, this one is, I find, really interesting. These are folks who basically follow Reaganomics. So they think everybody makes um, money or everybody benefits when business um, makes a lot of money, that government should stay out of job creation. Um, this is pretty much, a this is a classic economic conservative measure. So if you've ever heard of, say, a red Tory, or if you're looking and watching the Conservative Party of Canada leadership contest, uh, people who are like, oh, we should just get back to like our economic or market driven principles. That's this. And this is consistently one of the negative things or the negative predictors of energy transition where we're going to find opponents for transition. That's where we're likely to find them. Okay. Um, if we're looking for um, how people think and feel about indigenous autonomy over their land with respect to fossil fuel development, the first thing I would point out is that most Canadians, settler Canadians don't support this. Uh, which is not surprising, but also I think very much part of the problem. Um, things that make people more likely to support um, Indigenous autonomy over the land, there's very few things, but one of them is again, worry about climate change. And the largest negative predictor is predictably anti-Indigenous racism. Other things that we find. Most Albertans really, really want to see emissions from oil and gas reduced um, by 2030, but especially by 2050. Uh, I know that there's reason to be skeptical about uh, corporate narratives about being net zero by 2050, but if we're looking at the public opinion about this, there is a public expectation that um, emissions from oil and gas are going to be things that like will not be a prominent part of the future. People want stuff done about this. It's interesting too, in this, people identify the provincial government and the federal government, but especially the provincial government as having a key or the top role to play in this. So industry has a role to play too, but people are, are expecting the provincial government to act. Um, if we hear news information, for participants who heard news information about indigenous opposition to pipelines, they wanted more aggressive action taken on those emissions. Um, similarly, most participants really want um, electricity transmission or an electricity generation to be made more um, more green or to be uh, more focused on renewable energies and hearing more about how renewables, the prices are coming down, that there's opportunities to make money in them. This made people want this more. And so one of the things I would take away from this is that Albertans don't feel the same way about coal in terms of like a connection to it or like a kind of emotional or like pride based connection in something like coal, um, the way that they do oil and gas or the oil sands or things along those lines. Uh, and so this helps explain, I think, some of the opposition to metallurgic coal mining on the eastern slopes of the Rockies. People just don't want it in part because they don't feel like, like the, I feel like they've already moved away from, say, electricity generation from from coal. There's a couple of implications I want to draw uh, your attention to. Uh, 
Uh, if we're looking at the politics of energy transition uh, and the politics of transition are going to include uh, where the resistance to it is going to be coming from, uh, the resistance comes from market conservatives, people with high hopes in the future of oil and gas, even if they aren't necessarily grounded in reality, people who perceive that oil and gas is going to be Alberta's future, and people with specifically anti-Indigenous racist views. Those are the areas of opposition, and understanding that, I think, helps understand where the political constraints are going to be. Uh, I would say this is not the first place in Canadian politics I would identify. Um, settler resistance to Indigenous autonomy as a major stumbling block, but I feel like uh, this is, this is, it's worth emphasizing that this is part, and if there's any kind of view of equity or like justice being brought through energy transition, the problem of settler resistance and racism to Indigenous autonomy persists and is a, is a major problem here. And similarly, uh, if people are looking for a bit of hope at the end of this, I would say that there is, amongst Albertans, uh, in particular, and Canadians in general, there's much more of an appetite for transition away from fossil fuels towards renewable sources of energy um, than especially elite discourse coming from Alberta would suggest. I think I have very briefly gone over my time, and so I will stop. And thank you for your patience, and I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Thank you for the presentation. I, these are very interesting statistics and I hope we get to explore them a little bit and discuss more later on in the panel discussion. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Laura Wheeler, uh, pronouns she, her, um, is an applied microeconomist whose main research interests are in the development and labor economics. Her research agenda focuses on indigenous economic development, wealth and income disparities and labor markets in low income countries. She's currently an assistant professor in the economics department at the University of Alberta. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And I will also share my screen now. Um, so in these slides, I'm presenting some of my own ideas about the possible implications of federal control over First Nations oil and gas. And I will be suggesting that federal control of this industry has a range of relevant political and ethical considerations. Um, these are ideas that have uh, developed out of a research collaboration with Lucia Muhlenbox at the University of Calgary. And so some of the figures that you see on these slides have been drawn from that research project. So I'm going to start by giving a brief overview of the oil and gas industry by way of background, the oil and gas industry on First Nations land by way of background. Uh, this is a crude map of the Pigeon Lake Reserve and the wells that are on or near the reserve. So Pigeon Lake is about 50 miles southwest of Edmonton and it is home to four First Nations. The Pigeon Lake Reserve also sits on the Bonnie Glen oil field, which is one of the top 10 most productive oil fields in all of Canada in terms of cumulative production. Um, so what you can see is uh, the size of the bubble corresponds to cumulative production. And what I'm showing you are the wells that are on reserve and within 10 kilometers of the reserve. So what you see is that there's really a lot of production here, both on reserve and off reserve. Um, and this is only uh, one of many First Nations reserves with oil and gas resources. So there are approximately 70 First Nations reserves that have ever had any production in Alberta alone. And nine of those reserves are still actively producing according to our data. So we estimate, just to give you like a, a sense of the size of this industry, we estimate that at $60 per barrel of crude oil, um, production on First Nations reserves in Alberta in the last full year of our sample, that's 2020 to 2021, that would amount to $269 million in revenue. And that's only Alberta. So uh, there are more than 150 First Nations reserves with any oil or gas uh, production that have had any oil, oil or gas production um, across Alberta, Saskatchewan, and BC, although the majority of those are in Alberta and Saskatchewan. So this graph shows you quarterly oil plus gas production for all three of those provinces combined from the 1960s up to 2021. The red line indicates production from wells that are located off First Nations land, and the blue line indicates production from wells on First Nations land. Uh, so what you can see is that there's um, the wells off, off First Nations reserves are really dominating the wells on First Nations reserves, but 
Oh, this is not normalized by land area, and obviously First Nations land takes up a small fraction of the overall land area. So much of that discrepancy is just mechanical. But then if you zoom in geographically, and you only consider production on reserves or within two kilometers of reserves, you get a picture that looks more like this. So here you can see that production is much closer and it's actually overlapping from the 60s until the mid 1980s. So we do know that what I've just shown you is that um, there is quite a bit of involvement in the oil and gas industry on First Nations land. Uh, and we do know that there are um, several indicators of economic development that have been associated with oil and gas activity on First Nations land, including things like uh, higher median incomes and uh, low unemployment rates. So according to Stats Canada, um, the, the uh, three First Nations in the oil sands have higher median incomes than all other reserves in Canada. And Fort McKay First Nation, for example, even has a higher median income than 10 provinces. So, um, so that's just establishing the link between um, First Nations involvement in the oil and gas industry and economic development. But that's not really the focus of our research. So we don't set out to identify the direct impact of uh, oil and gas on First Nations. Instead, our research focus is on how federal control affects oil and gas exploration and production on First Nations land. So that's the area that I'd like to elaborate on a little bit more. But before we get into that, just in case you're not familiar with the context, I want to give a, a little bit of a primer. Um, this is really a, a vast oversimplification, but due to historical legislation, specifically the Indian Act, the federal government is trustee of First Nations lands and resources. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, what you need to know is that the federal government owns mineral rights on First Nations reserves, the federal government holds revenues from land-based resources in trust, and the federal government regulates on-reserve oil and gas exploration and production. So when I talk about federal control, this is more specifically what I'm referring to. So in principle, there are several channels through which federal control could impact uh, First Nations with oil and gas resources. For simplicity, I'm focusing on two channels, which I think may be um, uh, particularly important. So first I'm focusing on industry regulations. Due to federal control, oil and gas regulations have been relatively weak on First Nations land. And second, administrative costs have been relatively high for oil and gas activity on First Nations land. So I, I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment, but first let's discuss uh, regulations. There are different regulatory regimes that govern oil and gas activity in Canada. So Crown land is regulated by provincial authorities, whereas First Nations land is regulated by federal authorities. And actually the federal regime that's responsible for the disposition of oil and gas rights and the collection of rents on First Nations land uh, comprises three parts. The legislative authority is Indian Oil and Gas Canada or the IOGC. Um, and the IOGC operates under the authority of the legislative instrument, the Indian Oil and Gas Act, or the IOGA, and the regulatory instrument, the Indian Oil and Gas Regulations, or the IOGR. So this is a little bit technical, but um, I'm introducing this information to explain why I have characterized federal regulations as being relatively weak. So I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that the IOGA, that's the legislative instrument, remained largely unchanged from 1974 when it was originally passed until 2009. And during that period of time, the, uh, the legislation was only about 20 pages long. The IOGR actually remained unchanged until 2019, which was 10 years after the IOGA was amended. So the changes to the IOGA actually did not come into force until 2019. So to contrast that with uh, provincial regulations, let's just focus on the case of Alberta here. In Alberta, Crown land is regulated by the Alberta Energy Regulator and the legislative instrument is the Oil and Gas Conservation Act. But the important point I'd like to note here is that this legislative instrument has been updated every two years to keep up with industry developments. 
the, the most uh, current version of this legislation is approximately um, 90 pages long. So that's in contrast with the 20 page legislation uh, that's, that's uh, governing First Nations oil and gas. So uh, relative to the rest of the province, First Nations in Alberta have dealt with a thin and outdated regulatory framework, at least until the 2019 changes took effect. And actually in official IOGC documents, the amendment to the IOGA was characterized as a modernization of the legislation. So what you can see on the screen now is, uh, it's a screenshot from a federal website and it's effectively describing the modernization of the IOGA as a closing of a regulatory gap. And it talks about how eliminating this gap could reduce barriers to economic development. It could also provide greater certainty for stakeholders, uh, help ensure environmental protection, increase regulatory compliance and facilitate the collection of royalties. So all of this basically suggests that even the federal government uh, thought that the weak regulations may have been impacting First Nations negatively and in several different ways. So in principle, of course, there could be several different types of implications. Um, in particular, in theory, the regulatory gap could have implications for production, environmental outcomes, and royalty payments. To go from the theory to empirics, we need data. In our research, we do have data on production. So we should be able to say something about how weak regulations have impacted production outcomes. We may be able to say something about environmental outcomes. We could obtain uh, reported environmental incidence data. Um, it's unclear whether we'll be able to say anything about royalty payments. We have filed a request to access th those data, but it's unclear whether we will be able to get access to those data. But effectively, what do we know so far about uh, how federal regulations have impacted First Nations in practice? Basically, we're still trying to answer that question, but it seems that the short answer is that it is unclear. So there appears to have been questionable adherence to and enforcement of the federal regulations. And in particular, in cases where federal regulations were unclear, there may have been de facto adoption of provincial regulations. Um, also, if regulations, if weak regulations had been impacting production in the past, we would expect to see a discontinuity or a change in 2019 when the uh, stronger version of the federal regulations came into effect. We don't see evidence of that in our data. So at the moment, we have not found evidence um, of an impact on production outcomes, but we're still in the middle of the research. So this, I would still consider this to be a relatively open question. But beyond regulations, federal control could also impact First Nations through a mechanism I'm broadly categorizing as administrative costs. And when I say administrative costs, I'm referring broadly to the transaction costs that would be associated with a federal bureaucracy. And in particular, I'd like to touch on two points here, possible inefficiencies in federal management, and also the fact that oil and gas royalties are not transferred directly to First Nations. Instead, they're held in Ottawa with other Indian monies. So I'm going to briefly explain each of these points by um, going through a series of examples from news headlines. The first point that I'd like to raise is that the IOGC is not being managed by producing First Nations. In 1996, the IOGC did sign an MOU that uh, created a, a co-management board with the idea that First Nations would eventually take over full management of the industry. But as you can see suggested by the headline of this article, for many years, the IOGC has remained the ultimate decision maker. So this could be costly to First Nations if the IOGC faces a different set of incentives than the First Nations. In other words, the IOGC does not necessarily internalize the objectives of the First Nations. And I, I, I do want to acknowledge that this brings up a host of complicated ethical considerations that I'm not going to go into in detail here, but in short, First Nations do want control over their natural resources. However, it is also the treaty right of First Nations to have Canada maintain fiduciary responsibility, and that includes liability. So I do want to acknowledge that this is a complicated issue. 
Um, in addition, it has recently come to our attention that the IOGC is facing a multi-million dollar class action lawsuit over systemic racism in the organization. Uh, an independent report found that there's really high turnover of indigenous employees within the organization. Uh, there's limited access to development and career progression opportunities um, and things like that. So I'm obviously not in a position to comment on the particulars of the case, but these allegations suggest that the IOGC is not functioning in an efficient manner. Either way, uh, battling lawsuits is administratively costly. So not only does this have an impact on the indigenous workers working at the IOGC, but this also has an impact or it could have implications for the producing First Nations that rely on the IOGC to manage the industry. And then the final point that I wanted to raise is that oil and gas revenues are in most cases not transferred directly to producing First Nations. So once they're collected by the IOGC, they're held in a consolidated revenue fund or held in trust with other Indian monies. From this headline, you can see that the Bears Paw First Nation in Alberta has been fighting the federal government for the right to manage its own savings. And I think First Nations have um, many concerns about the implications of this trust. So many have pointed out, for example, that the government is getting relatively low interest rates for their savings. Um, and also if a nation wishes to withdraw money to let's say invest in an economic development venture on reserve, there's an administrative cost associated with accessing their money. So really you can consider this another source of inefficiency. So I'll just uh, quickly conclude with a few thoughts. I think that the big picture takeaway here is that federal control over um, indigenous oil and gas could have myriad ethical and political implications. For the most part, these implications have not yet been quantified. And so one of the goals of our research is to quantify some of those implications. I also think that this is a timely question. I think that understanding the effects of federal control is going to become increasingly important. So federal control over energy projects could impact indigenous energy sovereignty as well as transitions to renewable energy. Thank you, Dr. Wheeler. Um, our next speaker is um, Martin Oshinsky. Uh, pronouns he, him, his is an associate professor of law at the University of Calgary. His research interests are in environmental, natural resources, and water law and policy. And before joining the UFC, he was counsel with the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans and continues to practice law from time to time. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm just going to pull up uh, my presentation now, and hopefully that works. Everyone can see that okay? Yes. All right. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, climate change litigation. Uh, and as part of that, there's a bit of a discussion about the right to a healthy environment. But I'm going to be focusing first and foremost on sort of the state of play of litigation uh, around the world, and then specifically with respect to Canada. And so just in terms of a bit of an overview, uh, I'll start off by just explaining a little bit why it is, you know, we, we, I think I appreciate Dr. Thomas's presentation because it, it helps us understand that climate change politics and policy is a contested space. Um, and, and so that's an important aspect when we start thinking about how things play out and why they play out in the courts, for instance. When do people re seek recourse essentially in the courts in these kinds of disputes? And then I'm going to just um, give you a bit of a typology of, of the litigation that is happening. Um, not much of one in the sense that it's a fairly straightforward one. There's litigation against governments and then there's litigation against private parties. And so I'm going to give some examples of those both uh, around the world and in Canada. Um, and so throughout that, we'll be talking about those and, and perhaps where some of this litigation might be going on a go forward basis. And so the starting point here, I think, is um, you know, and again, as Dr. Thomas explained, like this is a contested space. This is an area where there are lots of uh, strong views. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll take the point and, and I thought it was very interesting, actually. I think, you know, conventionally for those of us who don't do survey work, um, we might assume that, that, um, that there is less support for aggressive climate action in Alberta than, than maybe in fact there is. Um, but even where there is support, 
you know, there is an issue of whether or not we're doing enough. There's always that question of whether we're doing that. We can say that, for instance, for the past six or seven years at the federal level, we have had um, a fairly uh, climate change uh, aware government, one that has been, in, in, in my view anyways, actually has taken unprecedented steps uh, in terms of developments in climate law um, and policy. But even then, you know, if you see the, 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 gra the, the screenshot I have here on the right from the Commissioner for Environment and Sustainable Development, who makes the comment at one point, recently did an audit of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions efforts, reduction efforts and climate change policy and called them incoherent, right? So, so even when governments want to do stuff, um, they don't always move as quickly and as coherently as we might hope. Uh, the most recent IPCC reports describe an atlas of human suffering. We felt that all very viscerally in Canada this past summer um, with the heat dome, uh, you know, several weeks of that, uh, towns burning, forest fires, air advisories, smoke advisories, all those kinds of things. So we are feeling these things, experiencing these things, suffering from, from climate change. And yet we can't seem to move, policy doesn't always move forward at the pace that we think is required. And it's really in those situations where people tend to have recourse to the courts, right? And, and so we know that, for instance, when we talk about things like racism, or if we talk about discrimination more broadly, you know, there, these are societal issues, and these are societal debates. But we also, you know, in instances of racism or of discrimination, we can have recourse to the courts, for instance, to vindicate our individual private rights, and sometimes even to vindicate what we might describe as public rights. So that's really the issue here. And it's not so much an either or, uh, you know, one or the other. I think these things often work in tandem. We bring things into the court of law to raise their profile in the court of public opinion and vice versa, right? So these are, these are the sort of two contested spaces where this stuff is happening. In terms of the litigation that we are seeing currently and have seen in the past, there's a fantastic website for individuals who are interested. Um, uh, held uh, essentially run out of Columbia University and Columbia Law School uh, in, in the United States, New York, um, the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. And what they have there uh, is a global registry, essentially, uh, for all litigation um, related to climate change. Um, and again, you, so you can see here in the, in the screenshot that I took, we have these, this basic organization of suits against governments, lawsuits against governments, and then lawsuits against corporations and individuals. And uh, in terms of suits against governments, they're not always the same. There are different, um, there are different angles or, or contexts, right? So, and, and I'll just speak to a few. Um, you'll see that one box there dealing with environmental assessment. So for instance, what is the, what is the role of climate change when looking at the adequacy of an environmental assessment. And in fact, what we saw recently is that in the United States, for instance, a court of appeals uh, overturned uh, a bunch of permitting um, that was done, um, I think in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, on the basis that uh, the government had not properly factored into the effects of all of that leasing activity on greenhouse gas emissions and on the climate. Um, certainly in Canada, we have had litigation that attempted to argue, for instance, that um, when a finding was made in relation to an oil sands project, for instance, that it wasn't going to have significant adverse environmental effects, and yet the project was going to lead to 800,000, um, the equivalent of 800,000 vehicles per year in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, we've seen the court sort of say that that analysis has to be done. Not that it decides the matter, but that analysis has to be done. So that's one example. You see other cases fall into that square of human rights. I think that in Canada, that would include our charter and section seven arguments. The Section seven protects our right to life, liberty and security of the person. And so I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. And then the suits against, against essentially corporations and individuals, these are essentially at this stage, largely against the, the big sort of what we might call big oil, um, the large oil and gas producers, uh, Shell, Imperial, you know, Exxon, whatever. Um, and, and the arguments there we'll see have really evolved uh, to take on sort of a, a similarity and a parallel to previous litigation in prior, in prior decades against the tobacco industry in terms of sort of misinformation and denial and those kinds of things. And I wanna probably should pause now to take one, to take a sort of, to acknowledge maybe the elephant in the room, which is of course the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that has, I think, 
heightened a little bit this whole discussion and it and it makes you know I, I, we're starting to see this kind of discourse which says for instance that you know maybe we need to for instance put climate change uh, mitigation on hold. Maybe we need to turn, you know, pause our transition towards renewables. Um, and I think, you know, coincidentally or not, uh, of course, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was followed very quickly um, by the IPCC's most recent report, which described that Atlas as suffering and really accentuated that we really do have a, a small and increasingly vanishing window to address these things. And so I think, I think the answer absolutely in the short term is that for instance, it's absolutely appropriate and I would support um, action by the government of Canada, for instance, to limit production or imports of, of Russian oil at this time. And, and we might have a serious conversation about where we get our petroleum products in this world and what kind of regimes we're supporting when we do that. But it doesn't obviate the need or, or, or sort of eliminate the need to transition towards uh, fossil fuels and to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, most analyses suggest that greenhouse gas emissions and that climate change, sorry, is a, is a threat multiplier. And, and so conflict and war, for instance, like we're seeing, um, is only going to be more likely the less stable our climate becomes. And we can, we can, have, that, we can have those conversations um, later. So then in terms of, again, using this, this neat um, sort of categorization or bifurcation of lawsuits against governments versus lawsuits against private parties, um, in terms of litigation against governments, what we're seeing so far is some, you know, I should always maybe start with some failures, especially historically, there were some failures. We're seeing actually some successes in, in the past four or five years increasingly. And then, of course, many lawsuits are just in progress, right? So we don't quite know where they've been. Probably the, the, the sort of landmark success is the Urgenda decision out of the Netherlands. And, and in this case, the court essentially found that the government owes a public duty of care to, to its citizens uh, to do more in that case, because the threat of climate change is so significant. Um, the court essentially relies on some very fairly specific civil law sort of principles that do apply to the, to the Netherlands and other European countries more so than in Canada um, to say that there was this obligation to, to do more, okay? And, and so they essentially, even though, you know, Europe generally countries in Europe are, are probably more advanced in, in the battle against climate change than, than we are here in North America, but that not enough had been done. And so that was a precedent setting decision. Um, another more recent decision in that vein of environmental assessment is Sharma. Um, and this is out of, out of Australia. And here the court, the federal court in Australia found that the Minister of Environment before issuing a permit for a coal mine, um, they declared that he owed a public duty of care to children and to future generations. Um, and so again, this is a very interesting case and it's making its way through the appeals process. It, it's not quite private law, not quite statutory law. It wasn't a finding, there were no damages awarded. It was almost like a anticipatory sort of finding that the court made um, that yes, you have a, this sort of duty of care that you owe to children. And when you decide, if and when you decide to issue a permit to this coal mine project, um, you need to take that into account. And we will assess your decision essentially for how you how you how you reconcile that that public law duty. Um, here in Canada, uh, in a bit of a twist on on litigation against governments, we had the provinces of, of Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario essentially challenge the federal government's ability to impose a carbon price, a uniform sort of carbon price across the country. And I'll speak to that a bit in a second, um, in a little more detail. And then we have these two cases: one in BC, essentially, and one out of uh, Ontario where uh, a group of children, essentially, again, children are arguing that uh, in, in the LaRose case, uh, Canada, and in the Marthur case, Ontario, are breaching their Section 7 rights to life, liberty, and security of the person because they are failing to take adequate action against climate change. So I wanted to just speak a little bit about those, those cases uh, that are particularly relevant and, and folks are watching them, I think, around the world. And certainly they're on the uh, climate change registry, the case there, uh, the, the Sabin registry that I described before. So, you know, the issue in, in reference to Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act essentially was whether or not the federal government has the jurisdiction to enact a sort of a minimum standards of GHG price stringency in Canada. And, and of course, this is a, you know, a, a, I don't want, you know, we're not a, it's not a law audience and so I don't want to get stuck in the weeds too much but you know essentially you can think of 
our constitution in sections 91 and 92 of the Constitution Act 1982, um, the federal government was put in charge of certain things or and more specifically parliament was put in charge of being able to pass certain kinds of laws. And the provinces under section 92 were allowed to pass certain kinds of laws. And the question was whether or not this law fit within parliament's jurisdiction, and in particular, a residual jurisdiction at the outset of section 91, or did it fall within the province's jurisdiction to regulate um, greenhouse gases, and, and which no one disputed that they had. The question was whether or not the federal government also had this kind of ability to say, you need to do something more. You know, and, and, and I don't wanna, again, we can talk about it more in, in the question period. Um, what I wanted to accentuate with this graph, which is actually from University of Alberta uh, professor Andrew Leach, is that a, a really driving determination. Ultimately, the Supreme Court decided that the federal government and, and parliament does have the jurisdiction to enact this minimum pricing standard. And there's a paragraph where they essentially give voice, they articulate what you see on this graph, which was that notwithstanding efforts by other provinces, BC and Quebec, for instance, which had lowered their emissions, the provinces of Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular had increased their emissions and the, and, the, and the lion's share of those increases were in the oil and gas sector. And so you could see in the court's analysis, it was very troubled by this reality that if in fact parliament didn't have the jurisdiction to make to, to pass this law, then essentially any kind of national effort or the, or the efforts of other provinces would be thwarted. Any decreases that they made in emissions um, were being offset by the increases in other provinces. And this essentially supported the finding that there needed to be a national standard. The other cases, um, Marthur and La Rose that I mentioned quickly, those deal with uh, the charter. And so I just wanted to pop up here, um, take this opportunity because the charter has been very popular, of course, in the last month or so. Um, a really important thing to understand about the charter, of course, is that doesn't it doesn't grant limitless rights. And so I wanted to include here, section one of the charter states very clearly that the rights and freedoms set out in it are guaranteed, but they are subject to such reasonable limits prescribed by law and can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. So all rights, freedom of expression, the right to life, liberty and security of the person, all of these rights are subject to this overriding provision in section one, which says essentially that some limitations can be justified if they are reasonably prescribed by law and, and are demonstrably justified. So the courts have developed over 30 years, a test essentially a framework for testing whether or not limits are justified. Um, and we've seen that framework being applied in the context of challenges to COVID restrictions in the past um, sort of two years. Um, and so I just wanted to just reiterate that again, because I think it is an important limitation and it applies also in this context of climate change. And so then, in these La, La Rose and Marthur litigation, the argument is that the, the charter under section seven entitles everyone, grants everyone the right to life, liberty and security of the person and the right to not be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And so um, again, there is a lot of case law building that explains what that means and how the courts are gonna apply that over time. Um, I've included here just very quickly, um, the those sort of scenario, the, the case descriptions, again, this is all on that Sabin Center uh, registry. So any of you who are interested, you can go on that registry and you can search all these cases up. In fact, you can even just Google their names and the first, I don't know what the folks at Sabin have done, they're, they're very clever because if you just Google La, La Rose, for instance, versus Ontario or Martha, um, you will get, the, the first hit will be the to the climate change litigation registry. Um, these cases are interesting, and so we're following them. One was dismissed right off the bat as essentially not um, creating a reasonable cause of action. The Marthur has has been has survived that kind of motion, and and there are some interesting dis differences between them essentially um, that involve questions around positive and negative rights, um, and and whether or not the charter protects those. And I, so I won't get bogged down in them because I'm mindful of my time. Um, so then I wanna just quickly say something about litigation against private parties. And that's probably litigation that I'm more familiar with. Uh, and so here we see several waves and, and there was a first wave we could say, and that was roughly in 2000 to 2015. And most of those lawsuits were not successful. Um, and then more recently, what we saw though was essentially an iteration, a learning from those, those prior suits and then and, and a readjustment of um, strategy. And in some respects, that mirrors exactly what happened in the, in the tobacco context. 
Um, if you look at the history of tobacco litigation, for, for most of several decades, for two decades, private individuals were unsuccessful in their lawsuits against, um, against tobacco industries, uh, companies for harms associated with tobacco-related disease. Um, and yet, but by a third wave, states joined the fray and really changed the dynamic and ultimately the tobacco companies settled for hundreds of billions of dollars. So we're seeing a similar sort of iteration in the climate change context. The first waves were unsuccessful. Then most recently there has been uh, a successful case out of, again, out of the Netherlands, but this time against Royal Dutch Shell, where Shell was ordered to reduce its emissions by 45%. We have many cases pending in the United States right now. And almost all of those involve lawsuits by municipalities. And in particular, not, not exclusively, but many of them are coastal municipalities, which are facing increasing costs of mitigating climate change, um, mitigating sea level rise, having to prepare and adapt. And so we are seeing several of those cases make their way through the courts. And there's all kinds of jurisdictional wrangling and procedural wrangling going on. Um, but what's really fascinating about them, again, is that they have now ex very explicitly are following um, the strategy of, of the prior tobacco litigation. So here on the slide, I just, on the left side, you have a description of essentially the pleadings in United States versus Philip Morris, um, you know, which describes essentially an industry um, that survives and profits from selling a highly addictive product that causes disease and a measurable amount of human harm, harm sorry. And it goes on to talk about uh, knowledge about these things and nevertheless, uh, the denial of these facts and so when you look then at the statement of claim in County of San Mateo versus Chevron, for example, you get a very similar sort of narrative, right? That this is about companies that have known for nearly half a century that fossil fuels will create greenhouse gas emissions that warm the planet, that they've known that, that they nevertheless engage in a coordinated multi-front effort to conceal and deny that knowledge, uh, that they've profited at that point. And that of course, the result is that the plaintiffs are incurring all kinds of costs that they then want to recover. And so that is litigation that is in its early days, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, and, um, and, and something to watch for the future and maybe relevant for all of us who are trying to buy maybe electric cars or hybrid cars right now when we can't seem to find any anywhere. You know, an interesting question, I think, is whether or not automakers themselves, they've recently also acknowledged that they had their own scientists who knew about and warned them about the dangers of fossil fuels and greenhouse gases in the 80s and 90s. And yet we saw nothing uh, no real effort to do that. And in fact, what we saw was um, attempts to sell larger, more GHG emitting vehicles, SUVs, trucks, and all those kinds of things. And so there's an interesting question about whether or not uh, automakers will be subject to this litigation in the near future. And I think that that's it for me for now. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, so the um, we talk, uh, all the speakers talk a lot about uh, policy making. So I think it's uh, it's very great that for our last talk, um, we're going to see how that policymaking can actually be put in place for um, the city of Edmonton. So we have our speaker, uh, Stephanie McKay, uh, pronouns she, her. She's a professional engineer and leads the urban planning and economy department that has over 600 people and ensure that Edmonton is a great place to do business and a great place to live both today and in the future. And I couldn't agree more. She mobilized teams and, uh, and uh, works in partnership with the city council, administration leaders, diverse community uh, groups and industry professionals to strategically advance collaborative efforts to build a city. Uh, she has an undergraduate degree from the University of Alberta and master's from the University of Toronto. She loves to spend time in the River Valley running all seasons and minus 30 is her favorite running temperature. That is amazing. Uh, welcome, uh, Stephanie. Hi everyone, it's my pleasure to be here with my um, fellow panelists and I love running in the River Valley in the minus 30 because of the quiet um, in the valley and the squeak of the snow. It's really my pleasure here to share a bit of uh, Edmonton's policy uh, that we have with respect to energy transition and climate adaptation. Really important files at the city of Edmonton with strong dedication from our municipal um, uh, governors, our, our city council, as well from as well from our executive leadership team. And really the way we tell the story is important. So my first few slides, I'm sure will be very familiar to you, but the reason why I've kept these slides in is part of um, the presentation from 
uh, Dr. Thomas showed that there's a variety of different opinions in this space and how you tell a story or how you explain the reason for uh, the importance of this work is something that we often talk about at the city. And so we frame up uh, many of our presentations in the first way as these first few slides. The other thing we often do is we talk about the dual opportunity before us. Um, one, the opportunity that we have to catalyze and diversify our economy um, through new investments in clean energy and innovation sectors, as well as for well-established uh, uh, businesses. So it's not just about making sure that we're ready for the future, uh, that, that there also is a absolute um, uh, new era of economic growth here for us to capitalize on. So my next slide is 70% of uh, energy related to greenhouse gases comes from cities. And you all know greenhouse gases trap uh, heat and results in global warming. And cities are also home to over half of the world's population. And that number is projected to increase uh, to over two thirds of the population by 2030. Cities also have a significant amount of infrastructure and provide services that are affected by climate change from bridges to roads to urban parks to emergency management services as we've seen in the number of wildfires uh, in both Alberta and BC that the cities have had to step in and provide resources to help uh, mitigate the impacts. So growing, uh, growing climate risks obviously have clear implications for cities, the people who live in them and our local economies. And we're also seeing the consequences of climate change play out already. Canada and Alberta are experiencing increases in the frequency and intensity of extreme climate events. Over the past two decades, there's been an increase in insured losses. And Alberta alone has had six of the 10 biggest climate hazard insured losses in Canada. And this chart shows the trending in insured costs of climate hazards in Alberta for the approximately the last 40 years. And as you can see over the last decade, there's an increase in the number and amount of insured losses. And we all know the impacts are going to continue to grow. Edmonton is one of the fastest warming regions um, in the world and science shows that our climate is expected to change even more significantly in the future. Scientists have stated our risk of urban flooding may double and experience more frequent and intense weather events and our ecosystem will change. So for every degree of warming, there's significant economic and social costs for Edmonton. Growing climate risks have a clear uh, implication for city resources, local economies, and Edmontonians who live in our city. And in the next few decades, it is predicted that Edmonton's GDP could be reduced by $3.2 billion annually due to increased costs associated with uh, impacts of climate change if no action was taken. So to avoid the most severe impacts of climate change, significant reductions in greenhouse gas uh, emissions are needed. From a greenhouse gas emission perspective, Edmonton is in a challenging uh, starting point because of our exceptional growth over the last few years, um, we have seen greenhouse gas emissions increased through, even though there have been a variety of efficiency measures um, uh, brought in. Uh, the per average person emissions have reduced over time. So where are these emissions coming from? There are four major sources in Edmonton, buildings, transportation, industrial manufacturing con construction, and a small, very small fraction from waste. So Alberta municipalities have higher greenhouse gas emissions when compared to other municipalities across the country in part due to the high amount of greenhouse gases produced by the provincial electricity grid. But there's some good news there. This is changing. Coal-powered electricity was mandated to be phased out by 2030, and electricity generators within the province have projected to complete this transition earlier, so by 2023. This transition, as well as the addition of renewable sources in the future of the electrical grid, will help support greenhouse gas reductions in the community. However, uh, this alone is not enough. So the city of Edmonton saw that there is a great need for us as a municipality to have a role in this space. And we're addressing climate uh, change in two ways. First, energy transition. We're taking actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. And this is the focus of the city of Edmonton's energy transition strategy. And our second response is about adaptation. Adaptation refers to the actions taken to prepare for and respond to the risks, as well as any opportunities of a changing climate. 
This is the focus of our Climate Resilient Edmonton Adaptation Strategy and Action Plan. Now to speak a bit more specifically about the Energy Transition Strategy. It's a 30-year vision and strategy and action plan for the next 10 years. It is about accelerated and transformational change. And this change will reimagine our energy systems and transform our community and economy. There's 105 actions in the plan and the strategy contains targets that are our boldest to date. This is the first plan of its kind for Edmonton. It's the first time Edmonton has targets aligned with the Paris Agreement. And this plan recognizes the urgency of the challenge as well as the economic opportunity it creates and presents actions at a pace and scale that is even more accelerated than our previous work in this space. The strategy identifies four pathways uh, for areas of transformation. They're inter interconnected and their actions in all of them are gonna be needed to meet the goals. They're, they are a renewable and resilient energy transition, emissions neutral, build, emissions neutral buildings, uh, low carbon city and transportation, carbon capture and storage and nature-based solutions. And underlining all of these is recognizing that we will need climate solutions leadership through this. We will need to work with the business community. We're gonna to need to work with Edmontonians. We look forward to working with researchers at the University of Alberta and maybe the University of Calgary. That was a joke. Uh, as we continue to transform our city. Really, it's gonna take everybody together to look at how we generate and use energy and how we move around the city how we construct and renovate buildings and how we attract investment and innovation in our energy sector. The second really important plan is our climate resilient um, Edmonton adaptation strategy, which focuses on preparing for and responding to the impacts of a changing climate and what that'll have in our community and on the city as a whole. This is the first ever strategy to prepare the city for a changing climate and will require things like transforming how we design, build and operate our city. The strategy will increase our, climate, uh, our city's climate resilience and minimize the exposure of our people and our assets to climate change and take advantage of new opportunities as we arise. This strategy identified five interconnected and transformative pathways science-based evidence, science and evidence-based decision-making, preparing for changing temperatures, preparing for changing participation, or precipita precipitation, uh, preparing for changing weather extremes and preparing for changing ecosystems. Now, exciting things to report. We just don't have strategies or policies in place. We're actually bringing those policies to life with a number of decisions that have been made by our council. And so our efforts to become a more climate resilient and energy sustainable city have, are not starting today, they're already clearly underway. Early work began as back uh, as early as the 1990s, and we took a significant step forward in 2015 under leadership of our previous council. And over the last six years, serious efforts have begun or, or underway. We know that the decisions made today about how we design and build our city, transportation systems, infrastructure and energy will set the course for our future greenhouse gas emissions. So we understand the importance of the work. There's a number of things underway. You'll see construction of the expansion of the LRT system. We've got protected bike lanes in our downtown, 40 electric buses, curbside, curbside uh, electric charging stations, as well as EV charging uh, and we continue. And there's more, let me share some more. We also have actions for residential solar rebates. We have a downtown district energy system that's been approved. We have rebates to support uh, home energy labeling and large commercial building energy benchmarking. And we've been evaluating the risks and identifying adaptations for city infrastructure. We also have uh, Blatchford, uh, one of our uh, large um, scale, I'm sorry, I've lost my spot in my notes. I apologize, I'm on the wrong slide. Uh, so district energy systems, and we have a, our world's first commercial scale facility that turns household garbage into biofuels and renewable chemicals. And we have solar systems that will be installed on five city facilities with more being planned in 2022. We have began construction in the carbon neutral Blatchford development and there are people living there now. 
We have offers for energy efficiency and rebates to support how home energy labeling and large commercial energy benchmarking. We've been evaluating the risks identified with our infrastructure. And we're very close, we're very excited about this one to launching our new program called the Clean Energy Improvement Program, which provides homeowners and organizations access to low cost financing to make energy efficiency upgrades and or renewable energy installations to their properties. And then it's, it's a financing program that is then repaid by the property owner through the owner's property taxes. There's also been action to improve our understanding of how our, climate, our changing climate is going to impact us. There's been a complete community-wide vulnerability and risk assessment. We've conducted science-based wildfire risk mapping and climate change modeling. EPCOR has led the work to analyze flooding risks for the community and to develop a flood, flood mitigation program. And Edmonton hosted the first ever intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, conference focused on climate science in cities. So these are just a few examples of some of the actions that are underway. And to add to the work at Edmonton's perspective um, from Dr. Thomas, the first presentation is Edmontonians do support this work. Conversations with the community aren't about whether climate change exists. The science has proven that climate change is real and Edmontonians want the city to take bold action. Our conversation now is more about what specific actions we need to take, how far we need to reach them and how fast do we need to go. Administration, that's uh, the public servants, uh, conduct an annual change for climate online survey with, ran uh, with randomized sample of Edmontonians and uh, it checks on Edmonton's perceptions related to climate change. And these results show that even as we focused on recovering from COVID-19 and the relaunch of our programs and services in a reimagined way, 74% of Edmontonians still agree, uh, are still concerned about climate change and 75% agree that we need to take action now. And I do believe that political will exist as well with our new council. We've got eight new council members and a, a new mayor, Mayor Sohi, who are also, also very dedicated to this file. So though we've started on this journey, there's still much more transformational work to be done. Over the next 30 years, we'll be changing our city, our energy systems, the way we move around, and the buildings in which we live, work, and play. We have goals of becoming a carbon neutral corporation by 2040 and being a carbon neutral uh, community by 2050. This will require a citywide zero emission vehicle charging network and active transportation network. This will have us reimagine where energy comes from through district energy systems and more solar installations through our city. And there's also gonna be more to do to adapt uh, and prepare our city infrastructure for our changing climate. And we know the city of Edmonton, we can't do this work alone. Transforming to a low carbon and carb, uh, climate resilient city is a collective effort and will take substantial political will from our city council. The city is just one array of many key stakeholders it will continue to connect and collaborate with other governments, regional partners, institutions, communities, business, businesses, academia, and global partners for accelerated action. Partnerships and a willingness to work together will be required to achieve a climate resilience outcome and significant public and uh, private investment is going to be required. We've estimated for our plan $42 billion over the next 30 years. However, because of the urgency to act and the need for accelerated climate changes, a significant portion of that investment is needed in the next 10 years. An average of about 2.4 billion per year of private and public investment is needed. So I think it goes without saying that climate resilience and climate energy challenges have both opportunities and challenges for us. And we're very excited at the city of Edmonton to have the opportunity here to share the journey of making policy, bringing policy to action, and that we've got lots more to do. And we look forward to working with the community on those future actions. Thank you for the opportunity today. Thank you to all um, our speakers for the excellent presentations and giving uh, our audience an overview of these different considerations and how they're shaping our policymaking process. So we will now transition into the open panel discussion. So if you have uh, additional questions, please uh, post that on the Q&A. But I think to get things started, I am going to... Um, I think this is a question that all the uh, panelists can probably address, but maybe um, um, 
I guess, uh, Melanie may want to address it first because it probably, um, um, uh, it's kind of related to the fact that we, we talk about all these political, economic, social, and legal um, considerations, right? And there are some municipal contexts, a provincial context, and the national context, and they're all very different. So how does that complicate um, or inform our energy systems planning? Yeah, so as a political scientist, um, I, federalism just makes everything really complicated, like really complicated and confusing. And it's the sort of thing where, uh, I mean, my colleagues who know the Constitution in its like precise detail can correct me if I've got this wrong, but having concurrent jurisdiction where you've got space for all levels of government to do uh, to actually legislate, um, it could enable a lot of collective action and, and it could, in like an ideal world, it could make it so that everybody could work together in ways that complement each other. But I think what we've actually seen is just a lot of passing of the buck um, from one level of government to another, to another. And this is one of the things where, I mean, I know in Alberta, uh, we don't really... I don't think as the public, the public really thinks about elections as democratic accountability, as in uh, you can toss the rascals out if they have done stuff that you don't like. Like I think particularly at the provincial level, like we're not a pivot for federal elections and all these other sorts of things either. Um, but having the federal context makes it so that it's really easy to say, well, that's not our responsibility. Um, that's something that another level of government should be doing. And what we see now is a context where you've got people in positions of leadership that are they're leaning harder into this, right? Like it's one thing if you, as a provincial, so the provincial governments, like municipalities do get their power from provincial governments. Um, but if the provincial government in this case is prepared to try to remove the power from municipalities to be able to work in terms of like public health restrictions, I can imagine, which is like a gross overstep, like I'll be very candid as, as an analyst that I think that that's not appropriate. But if you've got leaders that are in a position where they're prepared to do that, I can also see them being prepared to do that in the context of the environment. And so federalism makes it a lot harder to coordinate things. And so if you're looking at other contexts or other countries where they seem to just be more cohesive cohesive, moving more quickly, able to actually get consensus, or you can like, if I think in terms of the public opinion, a question that I would ask would be, if you've got a public where they have the same level of support for something, and they're making the same demand of government, and you've got one area where it's moving, one context where it's moving much more quickly, and you've got another context where it's moving more slowly, one of the things I would look for would be institutional constraints, like federalism. And then what other factors are there that are bringing bringing actors into the system that would be more or less willing to act on these sorts of things. So it just makes it harder to organize, but this is why I keep focusing in on at least that insight from my work, which is where most people want this. Most people want it very clearly um, when we ask about it directly. And so uh, I think that it's reasonable to democracy to expect that if most people want it, then that demand should be reflected in policy for sure. Um. So Stephanie, um, how about from a municipality kind of city planning perspective, um, how does that may have complicated things as well? I think it can definitely make it more challenging in terms of there's a, in order to uh, solve um, climate change, we need all levels of government to work together and private sector to work together. We, we all know that. Um, and it's really important for us to work with all levels of government at the same time uh, for, our, uh, for our city council to advocate to other levels of government for changes that are needed um, in the Municipal Government Act or even um, at the federal level as well. So I think our, our government has, municipal government has taken a, a leadership role um, in this space and they're gonna continue to take a leadership role in this space and we're gonna need strong partnership both with private sector and it will require advocacy to other orders of government as well. But I think we have seen things like the provincial governments um, have a role in this space, the C, uh, the clean energy uh, pilot program. It is funded um, uh, partially by the provincial government. So it's, uh, there, there is pos positive things happening in this space as well. Um, and maybe Martin and Laurel can also comment, like even from the legal 
perspective, like are there, did you see like um, like provincial, federal climate change kind of regulations also different, right? Are there major gaps that you see or major overlaps? Um, so the, the history of Canadian environmental law and policy definitely has a strong imprint uh, of federalism sort of concerns and tensions. Um, and in fact, historically, uh, the effect has been essentially for the federal government to take a very timid view of its jurisdiction um, and to defer to the provinces as much as possible in terms of their, to their preferences and policies with respect to resource development. Um, not without, of course, uh, polls and, and demands from Canadians actually that, that they wanted a, an assertive, strong federal role um, in this space. And so it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It seems to depend on the matter. Um, you know, jurisdiction appears to be sort of like either a hot potato um, when nobody wants it. Um, and, and we see that falling, we see that very common, for instance, like the issue, the problem of First Nations drinking water quality. That's a very classic example where, you know, in some respects it falls within federal jurisdiction, in some ways it falls within provincial. And the effect has been essentially they've been, you know, dropping it into each other's lap or saying, I don't want to get involved. And then in other spaces, it's very contested. It's like the, whatever the opposite of hot potato is when you want to assert that jurisdiction over something. And certainly that's the case in, in the natural resources space. What I will say is also interesting is that, you know, I say that generally the imprint has been one of, of um, timid federal action. Um, and But now we're seeing, of course, something quite different. We are seeing a more assertive federal government that is looking to really drive down our emissions nationally. But it wasn't always the case. In 2014, around 2014, 2015, in fact, we had a conservative federal government that was very reluctant to do anything on climate change. And it was really the provinces that were driving in Ontario and BC, for instance, um, really driving, and in Quebec, really driving aggressive action. Um, and, and that speaks to this. We have, there's this theory that federalism actually creates these laboratories. Um, you know, so there is this like, there's benefits of a central, strong central role and, and uniformity and consistency. But then every once in a while, we say that a federalism allows provinces to try different things. And if we were very rational about those different experiments, um, we might say that those are beneficial to the overall learning, right? That we can learn from BC, for instance, or we can learn from Ontario and apply that then nationally. So it's, it, there is a trend, there's a historical sort of imprint for sure. Um, and I will say that generally, I agree with Dr. Thomas, the effect has been generally to sort of a race to the bottom, that, that has been the effect of, of federalism sort of tensions and, and provinces really asserting that space. But every once in a while, it does seem to pop up these, there are these un, unpredictable dynamics and, and we see leadership from the provincial level that then does become you know, the federal standard. And, and let's remember that right now, the carbon pricing regime that we have in Canada is really built on the scheme that, the, that under the NDP in Alberta um, that was passed, the climate leadership plan in that context and all the mechanics. And so timing also, I think, I guess, is, is really important in all of this as well. Um, so maybe another uh, one of the question for Laurel too is, um, it's interesting you mentioned about oil and gas rights, um, but what about other types of like geothermal, like mining rights? Because even when we talk about renewable energy, we talk, often talk about mining, right? Rare earth minerals and all that. Do you think there would be sort of similar um, concerns that uh, they may have to? Yeah, I, th I think we can probably think about this as being a, a broader concern. So um, there are certain amendments to the Indian Act that would allow First Nations communities to opt out of um, some of the stipulations of the Indian Act. So there's, for example, the First Nations Land Management Act, um, which if a First Nation um, opts out of the Indian Act and adopts the First Nations Land Management Act, then they have more control over the management of, uh, of their lands. The problem is that oftentimes um, there are some trade-offs associated with uh, even these um, amendments to the legislation. And it's also very difficult administratively to, um, to, to develop a land management plan, to have that plan ratified. And, and so there are Kind of some practical logistical obstacles in in the way of um, of actually taking advantage of some of those amendments. So, I, I think that in practice, um, having greater control over uh, resources, it's it's a much broader concern than than just what I was speaking about with respect to the oil and gas industry. But yes, I think that it could be um, uh, 
applied more, more generally to some of other industries and other activities as well. Hmm. Um, interesting. Uh, we also have a couple of uh, audience questions. Uh, one of them, let me read them all. They are, uh, and you can probably read them too. Uh, someone mentioned that countries like New Zealand has granted a water body, like river, uh, the same legal rights as human beings. So if you harm a river, it's like you are uh, harming a person, for example. And so do you think that can be applied in the Canadian context with any um, of the panelists? Uh, would like to kind of try to see if you can address that. I guess it is a bit to tie to the right to also link to the kind of like a legal aspect, right? Like a right to a, um, like a healthy environment and all that. Um, yeah, do you think I mean, so impossible. <laughs> Yes, and, and so I think the answer is that, you know, I mean, in, in some ways, any, anything is possible um, when it comes to laws. Um, but, but just to say that, that we have, I have picked up and, and others are much more knowledgeable, this definitely isn't, you know, doesn't fall sort of squarely in my area, but, but it is something, I actually believe that some efforts have been made by Indigenous um, communities, peoples in British Columbia already to essentially confer these kinds of rights onto rivers uh, and, and land within their traditional ter territory pursuant to their own sort of Indigenous legal orders. And so that is very much part of the next frontier in terms of, I think, the, the reconciliation project in Canada between Indigenous peoples and Canada and, and, and the settler sort of um, society um, is how do we give effect to uh, and incorporate those, those Indigenous legal orders um, and their recognition of these kinds of things. And I believe that uh, actually University of Alberta professor Cameron Jeffries uh, gave a talk, maybe as part of this seminar or a different seminar in February, imagining what it would be like to grant those kinds of legal rights onto the North Saskatchewan River, for instance. So, so certainly scholars have and, and continue to think about this kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So just to quickly add to that. So New Zealand is one of these countries where when we look at the politics of it, uh, it's a, it's a comparison case, but it's one of these contexts where it, it doesn't have the, like the confusing constraints that Canada has. And so New Zealand has um, it's a unitary state, so it doesn't have to deal with the federalism side of this, but it also has um, a lot fewer Indigenous nations than what Canada does. And so it's significant that this comes from British Columbia, because British Columbia doesn't have treaty uh, the way that, say, Alberta would. And so and that that's where, I, like, there are reasons why that creates the kind of legal innovation that you would um, that you would see in where there's a reason why it's coming from British Columbia, these particular parts of that. The other thing I would note about New Zealand though, and I think this is important, um, particularly if people are thinking about this with respect to law and constitutional law, their original treaty documents have a different status and also their government treats them differently than treaty gets treated in, in Canadian context. So I can imagine this happening in a context where the Canadian governments would be prepared to, to treat the treaties that were initially signed as foundational like constitutional documents. Um, but the current state of Canadian politics has a lot of shiny rhetoric on top of that without any kind of intent from settler colonial like governments to actually act in that kind of kind of context. And I'm sure like there's more constraints about this as well, but it's worth noting that like you can see this kind of stuff in New Zealand, but they've got there are key things that are in place there uh, that enable and make space for that kind of work that uh, I've yet to see in the Canadian context. So I think we can move in that direction, certainly, and, and I hope uh, that we would, and I hope that we wouldn't have to litigate constantly <laughs> to get to that stage because it takes a long time. It breaks for very interesting decisions and things like this, but but still, it's it's not quite the same context. So. I know we're kind of uh, getting close to the time, but there's one question that I think it was very good. And I think you kind of, I, I do want to ask that. So um, one of the thing is politics and economics are often going hand in hand. And we even make our decisions, not just based on political preference, but also a lot of financial and economic considerations, right? And different stakeholders and different groups also have competing interests and opposing views. So. Um, how can we, like, when we make decisions, right, both at the, you know, at the federal level, provincial level, and even at the city level, how can we weigh the, the needs and these opinions? And is there a better way to even just help us to improve the way we address this conflict? So I would definitely love to hear from, from all of you. Um, 
maybe I, I guess would Stephanie want to uh, maybe. Sure, I'd be happy to start you out. Um, as a public servant, what I do is I bring rec or bring um, uh, our best evidence or our best recommendation to city council and then city council is ultimately the decision makers. And I think one of the other panelists touched on the fact that an election is really an opportunity for uh, for all Edmontonians to, to give a mandate um, to the to a council about what they would like to see. And so I think you know one thing that we do as public servants of the city of Edmonton is we really look to focus on that bigger story in terms of it's not just about climate change, it's about how we frame it to, uh, to a variety of different Edmontonians. Um, we also look to bring the best um, evidence uh, based um, decisions forward. And we've also looked at policy and market signals. For example, the Paris Agreement has been adopted by every nation and these commitments and targets have sent a clear signal on the market and the, in, in, uh, and the, the need for pace for change. So I think they do go um, hand in hand, but the way that we look at it is how do we bring those best recommendations to council with the evidence that has the most appeal to most Edmontonians. Great, thank you. Would others like to address that too? Any ideas? <laughs> I mean, the the way that I would look at this is that I think it's in economics and in politics, it's easy to see things as zero sum. And I think one of the ways that we can make this more productive is to move away from that way of thinking. Uh, I realize that it is a very optimistic view um, when it is sometimes such an effective short-term tool <laughs> to make things <laughs> seem like they're zero sum. Um, the other thing, just as a way of like kind of getting out of the conflict and the way that economics often gets deployed in politics, the one thing I would um, also focus on is um, uh, government budgets are not like household budgets. Uh, and government deficits aren't like things like credit cards that people have, like basically all of the analogies that we would draw for like our own regular lives to understand what the budgeting and the economic side of things look like for, for government is they don't work. Um, and so in that context too, I would say that these things, I agree with, um, with Stephanie that the way that economics gets brought into policy as a way of generating evidence to see what would happen if you make certain kind of choices and like what we have learned from that way. And so in that sense, I think that there's a great synergy between the two. Uh, and I would also just resist folks, um, resist the, the rhetoric and the temptation to follow the rhetoric that like uh, the way that this looks is presented in a zero sum kind of way, especially if it's drawn in analogies to like household income and various sorts of things. Like when government tells us they can't afford to do something, I mean, I don't want to say that it's always not true, but it's almost always really a foil for choices and priorities. And that it, the issue is like always saying, well, it's just because the money's not there. It just kind of doesn't work in that context of government. Um, instead, the accountable conversations can be brought to you. What are your priorities and why are you choosing to make these particular decisions and what are the principles that are going into them? Um, because with few exceptions, it's, um, uh, yeah, usually choices that are driven by something other than, say, economic constraints. Once again, thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again. And thank you very much to our speakers.